with the framework for uh, period four. And I want to kind of show you what uh, you're looking at in terms of this this time period, period four, 1800 to 1848. You may recall we already started with uh, the idea of what, and we're going to really look at this to get today as well, the idea of what is participatory democracy, sometimes called Jacksonian democracy. Be sure you know phrases like suffrage, the right to vote. Initially, voting, uh, really almost throughout most American history, voting was determined uh, by the requirement to have some degree of property. But uh, as, as time changed, many white men, particularly of the sort of working class, factory workers, yeoman farmers who rented, uh, wanted to have an opportunity to participate, and thus they began to demand it. Uh, and with that, we had sort of an organic evolution of political parties. You definitely want to know what the first two parties were. Uh, obviously, Hamilton supporters became known as the Federalists, although that, that was a philosophy that already existed. Uh, and then the Democrat Republicans were the followers of Jefferson. Uh, by the time of Andrew Jackson, the era of good feelings would come to an end. Their good feelings, you may remember, was when James Monroe presided over a brief period where we had a single party, the Democrat Republicans. Uh, and then with Jackson, as you see here in letter C, uh, we had the formation of a new uh, Democrat party. Basically, the word Republican was dropped because guys like John Quincy Adams were seen as national Republicans. That term became common during his period. Uh, and then by Jackson's second term, you had a unified, unified sort of opposition to Andrew Jackson made up of a variety of people, south, southern, western, northern, uh, that became known as the Whig Party, drawing their name from folks who were, you know, English uh, leaders like Burke and, and others who had been... Uh, uh, you know, willing to question authority of the monarch. And so we look at Andrew Jackson being called King Andrew the first. Uh, also the issue of a national bank. Uh, keep in mind that this was renewed under Madison. Protective tariffs, part of Henry Clay's very famous American system. And the huge debate over federal funding of infrastructure or internal improvements. So this is much of the hallmark of the late 20s and early 30s. The, the, the AP or College Board describes it as regional interests. Uh, you can definitely recall this is going to lead to the birth of sectionalism in, in the sense that Andrew Jackson, it, while being the president of the United States, is in many ways like a, a Western representation or incarnation. John C. Calhoun becomes the embodiment of the South. Daniel Webster, New England. And somehow Henry Clay tries to work all that together and to make one big country. And the major division over slavery and the role of the federal government and the economy. Now, this topic of culture uh, is really two separate uh, lessons that I've taught in the past. One regarding um, the emergence of a truly unified American culture, uh, sort of the nationalistic period of the American feelings. Uh, and then the other being the religious transformation that occurred uh, in the United States during the Second Great Awakening, which is in and of itself a PowerPoint slash lesson. Um, so we'll skip through this part today. We're not going to really look at that part. Um, and then we see here similar things involving cultural changes. So if you'll notice, the political part is really this first concept, uh, this first concept for one Roman numeral one. And that's kind of what we're going to look at today. And then later this week, we'll do the Industrial Revolution uh, and the cultural reform movement. Keep in mind, all that's going on at the same time, though. So when we talk about agrarianism, uh, that's Andrew Jackson's people primarily. Um, and then we scroll through here and we see the rise of the South. Uh, and here's a, a couple political points to, to recall. Um, after the Louisiana Purchase, which of course you recall, Thomas Jefferson, uh, 1803, uh, from Napoleon, wanted to control the Western Hemisphere uh, in terms of influence, particularly in regards to European re-expansion. And so think about the Monroe Doctrine. You may recall Jackson, or we'll definitely talk about it today, the Indian Removal Act of 1830. Um, and of course much American Indian resistance. I did a lesson the other day on uh, resistance to um, to Western expansion by the American people. Uh, and this is slavery as a major topic. So these are your key concepts for, um, for period four, and I hope to knock this out by the middle of the week so we can get really into five uh, and get to the Civil War. Um, so I'm going to close this now and uh, then move over to the PowerPoint on this topic of participatory democracy
uh, and the end of um, really the, the, the caucus system overtly. Um, and then we will switch to a much more national political movement with uh, the rise of the common, so to speak, common. Um, so here comes the Andrew Jackson PowerPoint. Much of this doc, uh, this, this PowerPoint was generated by a, a fantastic website. I give credit to that word, Duke. Um, the lady has something called PowerPoint Palooza. So if anybody ever wants to check that out, she's got a lot of information um, that's useful for us teachers and for students. So let's take a look at uh, this idea of Jacksonian democracy. And, and, and keep in mind, Jacksonian democracy in many ways is a descriptor that is sort of unrealistic. Uh, it's, it's often called this because Jackson was representative of the democratic common man, but it was not simply a, a result of him. I like to think of Jackson as the embodiment of the trend rather than the creator of the trend. So in many ways, you know, critics of President Trump allege that he's a nativist or you know, that he's a, a protectionist or things like that. And, and it's possible yeah, that's certainly his, his philosophy but in many ways, he's reflective of a large trend in the United States right now. Uh, and so when you think about representative democracy, many times the people we elect are, are reflections of where we are in a certain time period. So the trends at this time that you definitely want to be aware of, as alluded to earlier, is the abolishment or the gradual elimination of property qualifications. If you look at the, the map on the left, you see this sort of teal green. Almost all the states uh, in 1800. The election of Jefferson had some degree of either property or, in the case of the pink states, tax requirements. Only Vermont and Kentucky had universal male suffrage. It did typically start at the age of 21, not 18. Um, later, you see the property part is, is removed, but there's still an element of some degree of qualification in places like Philadelphia and Boston. Uh, here in Virginia, you still had to at least pay taxes. So this is a way of sort of, you know, eliminating the unessential poor white class uh, of Americans who, in, in many ways, were, as perceived, were not contributing to the society of the country, thus should not have a voice in its representation. Only a handful of states here, really Carolina, Tennessee, and Rhode Island, still have property. And you see kind of boldly the idea of universal male suffrage, particularly in, in New York, a big state, and even down in South Carolina, kind of aristocratic state. So... With that, this is what they often talk about Jacksonian democracy, the elimination of requirements for white men. So, you know, a critic looking back would say, oh, this wasn't democratic. This represented about, you know, a third of the, of the American population at best, probably closer to a fourth. Uh, and, and thus not a whole lot of democracy there. But, you know, baby steps, folks. But it's gradual democracy, not radical uh, democracy. Um, and so with these requirements removal, you see a much greater participation rate amongst those eligible. You can look there at 1840, a, a really kind of boring election if you consider Martin Van Buren and William Henry Harrison, but 80% voter turnout. It's astonishing. The election of Abraham Lincoln, 81% voter turnout. That means eligible people who could vote came and voted. Today, America celebrates if half the eligible voters in America show up to vote. So this is an astonishing degree, and of course, what we know uh, about that is a rise of something called the spoil system. A lot of people voted simply because they wanted to get something out of it. You know, they were like, "What are you done for me? What are you going to give me?" And so, be sure to know these characteristics when you're studying. Know the idea of the expansion of suffrage, and I do want you to recognize the end of what is called King Caucus. Now, caucuses didn't end altogether. Uh, caucuses still exist at the national level uh, in places like uh, uh, Iowa. But by and large, the, the idea of like eight guys or 12 men sitting around and picking the top five names to choose from uh, is going to be reduced with a much more kind of raucous, freewheeling event called the convention. Now, today's conventions are highly scripted. We already know who the candidates are prior to the convention. We know now here in April of 2020, it's going to be Biden versus Trump, you know, and, and, and really that's because of something they call the primaries. Um, so that didn't exist at that time. And, and this nominating convention was a new development. Um, and voters themselves would often have much more input into who the states put forward as electric candidates. If you may recall, like in 1860, uh, Abraham Lincoln wasn't even on the ballot in many southern states, not even on the ballot at all. So 
again, the ways people voted was kind of different than the way they vote today. Well, extremely different. Um, keep in mind the spoil system, my hallmark of Jackson. Now, Jackson is usually labeled as the spoilsman, but really presidents before and after him were spoilsmen too. It's more about the sort of embodiment of the idea that to the victor go the spoils. The principle of rotation in office, Thomas Jefferson already embraced, although he didn't really do it as a president. Uh, and you start to see for the first time in America, other parties, the anti-Masons will emerge, the, the famous know-nothings. So people who are kind of single issue candidate parties. Um, and, and really Jacksonian democracy is the beginning of what we would consider actively campaigning. The surrogates of the candidates and sometimes even the candidates themselves would take to the hustings. They would go out and campaign. So you'd have like chop down trees and they would stand on the stumps and you had the famous stump speech. Um, now with Jackson's re-election, uh, excuse me, in 1832, you have the emergence of the new party system. This is the end of the, the, the single party era of good feelings and the rise of the Whigs. The Whigs' grandchildren will be the Republicans. Uh, and of course, you could argue that the origin of the Whig part of the National Republicans were really the Federalists, you know, old Federalists kind of under their new identity. John Quincy Adams was recognizable as this. Um, so he, here's a quote, uh, and I have these in the docs as well, but it's a quote from probably the preeminent American antebellum historian, Gordon Wood. Uh, this guy's been at it for a very long time. And, and he says here, we had experienced a transformation by the end of the war of 1812 and how we perceived ourselves to the world around us. Uh, our population was growing dramatically, both from internal reproduction here in the country, but also immigration, much, much movement. And so what you see here is demographic, that means who people are, population, and commercial changes that affected our lives. And, the, the, you know, when you think about who George Washington was or John Marshall is, they were, he says, essentially aristocratic. And this is being changed with very democratic elements. Uh, and so while today people often criticize political parties and often with, with good reason, at the same time, it is a sign of the expansion of, of democracy. So while our founders created in many ways a representative republic, uh, this will become a much more democratic uh, movement. And, and of course, it not in, in comparison to say the, the 1960s, but compared to the rest of the world, and I want to emphasize that America was really one of the most democratic countries on earth uh, in 1815. Um, so Jackson, you know, his background, we've already talked about his role in uh, the War of 1812, his role as an Indian fighter. He uh, was a very fascinating individual. He not very well educated, read to, to the bar, you know, stud, apprenticed in essence as a lawyer and then became a lawyer. Uh, and yet in many ways would be the strongest executive the president, uh, excuse me, the country would have until, uh, really until Abraham Lincoln. And so Jackson is one of the, you know, considered great presidents. Uh, and there are many policies that he does, which, which I don't agree with or support, but he absolutely will dramatically transform the role of the presidency. Um, his early life will not probably be on the AP exam, but it's useful to know that while he started in, in sort of impoverished frontier conditions, he was orphaned. Uh, you know, he was hurt uh, during the American Revolution. He was actually slashed with a saber as a young, as a, a lad, a child, a young boy. Uh, and he, you know, would move into what was then the frontier of North Carolina, Tennessee. Uh, and then from there, he would develop his sort of cabin into this, the Hermitage, which is Jackson's sort of estate, his plantation. So he is a rags to riches story, and he never forgot sort of the rough hewn origins that he came from. He maintained that throughout his life. Uh, he was a uh, very kind of rough and tumble fella. In fact, uh, you know, his, his name that emerged during both the War of 1812 and the Seminole Wars would be Old Hickory, this tough as a, a you know a hickory stick fella, tall, lean, uh, often emaciated looking, and yet with absolute willpower. Uh, just a really fascinating guy. So when he ran for president, and I use the word ran, really, he allowed himself to be nominated. In 1824, he was a war hero. He was probably the most famous person, one of the most famous people in America. The frontier loved having one of their own run for president. This is a guy who'd hung out in taverns and with, you know, all kinds of uh, odd fellows. And so here was, you know, somebody who was of the people. Uh, and so he was run, uh, here you see, as a, a campaign poster. 
uh, the hickory tree. Um, and, and this is how the election shaped up. Now, you know, John Quincy Adams, not going to be an AP exam question. He had, you know, he was the incumbent. He, he, he was not the incumbent, excuse me, but he was coming out of the role of secretary of state, the most probable nominee. Um, and, and really the other great name at the time was, was Henry Clay. And so you have sort of two regional candidates, a, in the West, a New England candidate, a deep South candidate and another deep South candidate. So you had all the regions kind of represented here. Um, Calhoun was so popular, he ended up being on the vice presidential ticket for both JQA and uh, Andrew Jackson. Crawford will have a stroke. Uh, and really, that means there's only three candidates, so JQ, uh, so JQA, Clay and, and uh, Jackson. Um, and so this election turns on an interesting uh, you know, outcome. You, you see here that no one receives a majority of the electoral vote. And the Constitution is very clear that if no one receives a majority, that's not a plurality. We call this 38% number here that Jackson has. Uh, if you're looking on the right side of the picture, 38%. Uh, when you have the highest number, but not the majority, it's called the plurality, plural. Uh, and, and so you see here, 62% of Americans had not voted for Jackson. Uh, but he had more than anybody else. And so his supporters consider, well, you're the winner, but that's not how the constitution works. The constitution says if nobody has uh, a majority of the electoral vote, then the house of representatives will choose from the top two vote getters. And so in this case, uh, you know, like I say Crawford had had a stroke. I guess they didn't get the memo up in Virginia in time, um, or in his home state and clay, uh, finished a distant third. Um, and so, with or fourth, really, sadly for him. Uh, so Clay's out of the running. So that leaves JQA and Jackson. If you compare the two, uh, you know, Jackson had gotten more, but not the majority. So under the rules, the House gets to determine, they get to vote, one vote per state. Uh, and Clay is a very influential leader, and he he gets and meets with, and, uh, excuse me, John Quincy Adams, and the argument goes that he traded the votes of his supporters, here you can see them, in exchange for the role of the Secretary of State position. Um, Clay was certainly qualified for that job. He and Adams didn't really get along at all. They didn't like each other. But nonetheless, um, we don't know for sure. We don't know if John Quincy Adams said, yes, you may definitely uh, have this office. Uh, but nonetheless, in the House, uh, John Quincy Adams would be elected president. And his supporters would cry foul. And, and basically for the next four years of John Quincy Adams' presidency, uh, our sixth president, uh, the opponents of this election would basically consider him an illegitimate president. And, and, and unfortunately for John Quincy Adams, he was really not uh, not the right president for the times. And so he would be defeated in 1828, um, much more nationalist in a period when we began to become more sectionalist. I always like to teach about Rachel Robards Jackson, who was, uh, interestingly enough, not not named Robards or Jackson, last name, uh, Rachel Donaldson uh, gets her, her, her background, her childhood from Pennsylvania County. Rachel Donaldson and her family were one of the original founders, her father, of the Pennsylvania County community around what is today Chatham. And they had moved west, uh, and that's where she had married an individual named Lewis Robards, his name here. And then Lewis Robards had abandoned her, which is not as unusual as that may sound. Uh, and he left her, and she assumed for another woman. Uh, and, and, and it hurt her feelings, obviously, that's a terrible thing. But she assumed, uh, unfortunately, that she had been uh, divorced. And so she and Andrew Jackson, who fell in love with her, uh, get married. And then the, the fact comes out that technically, Lewis Robards had never filed for divorce. And so technically, if you, you consider the law, Rachel Robards was now married to two men. And so Andrew Jackson quickly moved to get that corrected. But this would be a, an actual issue topic, you know, mudslinging in the campaign of 28. So much so that the story goes that Rachel Jackson died as a result of sort of heartbreak from this election. Uh, and Andrew Jackson was absolutely heartbroken and furious. You know, he, he would blame uh, the National Republicans, the Nationalists men uh, for, for these terrible arrows. You know, this wormwood, she called it that was aimed at her in politics and just an ugly election in that respect, not John Quincy Adams himself, but many of the surrogates. So when the election came down, it was not a purely sectional election. You can see here, 
Jackson does extremely well in both the South and the West, as well as even as far north as Maine, New York, and Pennsylvania. And so Jackson has sort of triumphantly taken the office that, that his supporters believed was due to him in 1824. And uh, this would be the Democratic uh, sort of coalition that emerges and remains this way until the election of Abraham Lincoln. So within this group are the planter elites, the frontiersmen, you know, the rough hewn frontiersmen, often yeoman farmers, the spoilsmen, often of the biggest cities, and immigrants. So this would be this successful coalition of the Democratic Party uh, and really an opportunity for uh, dominance by the Democratic Party until the election of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, the only time the Democrats don't win an election is when the Whigs run a very popular war hero. Uh, that becomes the only strategy that will defeat them. So Jackson does represent the attitudes and philosophies of a lot of Westerners, uh, particularly the you know distrust of the establishment, the man, so to speak, the people in charge. Uh, and, and he truly was, even though he was an aristocrat, I guess you could say by that point, he truly was of the of the people. He was a you know, common man and doing uncommon things, which you know is pretty remarkable. Um, his election, uh, excuse me, his inauguration was famous in that it was called the inaugural brawl. You know, this is where the kind of country boys descend on Washington and the White House and destroy furniture and, and really have a, have a grand old time, you know, a good old party. Uh, and then he takes office, you know, and Jackson will really seek to transform the office of the presidency into much more of a role of the individual leader, the tribune of the people, the executive as an active leader. Right out the gate, and again, I don't think you need to know any details about who Peggy Eaton was, but right out the gate, it should, now keep in mind, much of his cabinet was selected by the Democratic leadership to be chief officials uh, in, in the government, not necessarily personal friends of Andrew Jackson. And so when the cabinet sort of treated this woman, uh, Miss Eaton, Ms. Eaton, with uh, their wives, with crude, you know, kind of gave her the silent treatment, I guess you might say, they snubbed her, he got furious with them and he basically dismissed his cabinet and didn't use it anymore. Uh, and instead, he did rely on the advice of his closest advisors, his trusted friends, or some within the political machine like Martin Van Buren who, who, whose insight uh, he, he appreciated. Now, I want to remind you that the idea of democracy was, was very prevalent in the minds of Americans, uh, and not only Americans, but Europeans. And this is probably one of the most influential books ever written on the topic of American democracy, certainly in this era. And it's called Democracy in America. Alexis de Tocqueville It's one of those names that you often hear, particularly if you take any kind of American history or government classes in college. And he says here uh, it, that America ins uses democracy, instructs democracy to reanimate itself, to purify itself. To, in other words, they, they trust uh, their own wisdom to the time and circumstances in which they live. All right. And so, in other words, democracy is the ability of the government to evolve with the period that, uh, that it lives in. And yes, we certainly have fundamental institutions that haven't changed very much, but the law is, is able to be adaptive uh, to, to the times that we live in. So, you know, example would be like regulations of the internet would not be something anyone would have considered in 1830, but certainly the government has had to consider that, you know, cloning debates, space exploration, uh, and, and laws evolve with this. Now, one of the other things he points out interesting enough, is this sort of emergence of a very specific role of women in domestic life. And so here he's alluding to what we would now call the cult of domesticity uh, and Republican motherhood. And you can see, I have nowhere seen women in a loftier position. Uh, what the prosperity and growing strength of people ought mainly to be attributed to is the superiority of their women. So while we look back at the 1830s as a period of sexism, uh, as a period of, of, of of gender discrimination, uh, women in America were perceived to be much more actively involved in society than they were in Europe. So comparatively, that's useful. Obviously, to today, it doesn't relate as well. But keep that in mind whenever you're writing about a period in history, essay-wise, that you want to consider what was going on at that time period, not simply now to them, but rather then to them. Um, so the first major crisis faced by Andrew Jackson 
was something that had been kind of brewing during President Monroe's presidency and John Quincy Adams. And that was the, the idea of this state have the right to not follow what the federal government said. And and this was a, not a new debate. I would remind you that uh, during the quasi-war, the Alien and Sedition Acts were passed, and you had something called the, the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions that basically said, you know, if a state finds a, a federal law to not be consistent with what that state needs, then they don't have to follow it. You know, and this is a debate that we still have, I mean, across the country. It, not just in a pandemic, but about any kind of federal law that, that people in some state don't agree with. And so you had a very heated debate in Congress at the beginning of the, of the session of 1830, in which the New England representative, most famous, Daniel Webster, argued very well with uh, Senator Hayne of South Carolina. And the two of these individuals got into a huge debate about, you know, what is, what is the purpose of, of the federal government? Is the government to represent all people or is the government a collection of the individual states so in other words you know is the union something that states participate in or is the union something that all people make up and, and, and we're still to this day having this debate like what defines america as a nation uh it's not an ethnic group it's not you know collective states but it's it's a creed a belief in a creed that we as an american people share but, you know, that's that's something that we've had to argue and debate, and we still will all share that, that opinion. And so they represented their section, but they also represented more classic views of the American political sort of mindset. But this debate is going to culminate in the secession of the South and the Civil War. And so at the core of the Civil War is not simply a debate over slavery, although that certainly is relevant, but rather can the federal government determine the actions of individual states? Uh, particularly when the state doesn't want to do it. And in the end, uh, this was the first major test of that, and Jackson is going to show how he, how he does it. Because here you see Webster referencing that the two go together. You can't have liberty without the Union. Uh, and Jackson says we must preserve the Union. And Calhoun, who's the other figure like Senator Payne of, of, the, of South Carolina, interestingly enough, but now he's currently vice president of you know, the United States, and he says the Union next to our liberty. So he, he is taking a really, he, both Hayne and Calhoun are taking positions contrary to the idea of that this is how our liberty is, is defended, but rather we have liberty and the union exists, you know, that's two separate entities. Um, and the issue that they're going to argue over is pretty boring you know, from most students' perspective. It's a tax on imports. Yippee. So, you know, of course, taxes are always important. And the one noteworthy thing during the presidency of John Quincy Adams is the passage of the something called the Tariff of Abominations, or the Tariff of 1828, the Black Tariff, it was sometimes called. So this tariff was actually a sort of poison pill created by the Dems to try to you know, corner John Quincy Adams, and, and he ended up passing it, or signing it. Uh, and the tariff dramatically increased rates. I don't think you ever need to know the specifics, although I've given you guys a handout on tariffs. Uh, and, you know, John C. Calhoun secretly authors a document very reminiscent of the South of the uh, Virginia Kentucky resolutions, and in it he says we're not going to we're not going to allow this tariff to be enforced. Basically, you know, it more or less summarizes what what Jefferson and Madison had already written, but it also goes so far as to basically say, you know, if a tax collector tries to enforce this in the port of say Charleston, uh, he may face tarring and feathering. Uh, and and so, uh, Jeff. Jackson's ire is getting up and introduced Henry Clay. Clay comes in and says, well, just lower the tariff. That'll solve the problem. And, but now South Carolina sees they have an opportunity. Oh, well, they're going to lower the tariff over a threat. Let's, let's demand that they continue to lower the tariff. Uh, and, and Jackson's like, no, this is the tariff that passed, and you will allow it to be enforced. It's not the tariff of abomination. It's actually a lower tariff. But South Carolina says we are going to nullify it. So it's this nullification concept we hold that it's a compact between the states. Therefore, we can pronounce judgment on the federal government as we deem inherent. So here it is, you know, 30 years almost before the Civil War in South Carolina saying, hey, man, if we don't agree with the feds, we can just essentially determine it as null and void, nullification. So that is going to be responded with uh, Andrew Jackson and the Congress are going to pass a bill called the Force Bill. It authorizes Andrew Jackson to invade South Carolina in order to enforce this new tariff. Henry Clay is concerned that you know this might lead to a civil war. 
uh, and in 1833, he, he negotiates with South and the White House a reduced tariff, another reduced tariff that would be phased out gradually over the next decade. And this is this is called the Compromise Tariff of 1833. Another reason why Henry Clay is known as the Great Compromiser. Um, he was architect, you might recall, of the Missouri Compromise in 1820. So with this introduces something we have already discussed, and that is the real problem of of, of states coming into contact with Native Americans who are existing under treaty protections. Jackson wants to avoid the death of Native Americans, as he says, the, the strife between Georgians particularly and, and the civilized tribes, as they were called. Uh, and so you have a, a law passed by his supporters in Congress called the Indian Removal Act. Uh, and we've talked about this earlier, so I don't want to spend too much time on it, but basically the, the good people of the Cherokee, led by, uh, you know, they're by both their own tribal leaders, but also by American missionaries who have who've come into Cherokee to try to you know, convert them, but also to, to sort of help them. Uh, and, and, and they sue uh, very smartly. Uh, and John Marshall, Supreme Court Justice, says, hey, you know, you uh, there's a treaty that exists. And this area here uh, has been defined forever as being Cherokee. And, uh, you know, the Cherokee entered into a compact rightly. Um, and here the Georgians were migrating in here. And so what happened was, you know, this sort of crisis of the Constitution where, you know, Jackson has allegedly have said John Marshall has made his decision. I'll let him enforce it, meaning if I'll send troops into South Carolina to enforce a tariff, but I'm not sending troops into Georgia to prevent Georgians from moving towards the Appalachians, even if it means Indians uh, get harmed, natives get harmed. So that's the goal for the Indian Removal Act is to take the five, quote, civilized tribes, uh, you know, ugly language and and forcibly if necessary relocate them uh to indian territory which is now oklahoma uh, much of this occurs actually under martin van buren uh, the next president it doesn't actually occur during jackson's presidency as much but we, we looked at you know what what happens here is thousands of of these civilized tribes creek and cherokee seminoles are going to freeze to death and starve and suffer from public ex I mean, from exposure to the elements. And then uh, white Americans aren't going to give them the opportunity to even travel across the Mississippi River by ferry boats and things like that or some of the other rivers here in Alabama. So this is a real terrible moment um, in, in American history. Um, okay, and so our third big topic under Andrew Jackson, so we've got you know, the nullification crisis, the Indian removal act, and the third issue, which is one that he probably wouldn't have have, have dove into, so to speak, had not it been for the bad decision of his rivals in 1832. Now, Jackson was, you know, most famous for his use of the veto amongst his critics. This is why the Whig Party emerges. He famously had vetoed an internal improvements program called the Maysville Road under Henry Clay. And, and his critics called him King Vito and King Andrew. Uh, and so they decided to recharter the Second Bank of the United States early. Uh, and this was not necessary. The Second Bank of the United States could have existed through President Jackson's presidency, but they wanted to force him to either sign this bill into law, the recharter, thus alienating some of his own supporters, or veto it, thus wrecking the American economy. Uh, and so they backed Jackson into a corner here. And Jackson, you know, this is a guy who, who stared down men at gunpoint. Uh, and and then they, he was not afraid of anything. Uh, and so he said, okay, bring it on. I don't like the bank anyway. So the, the head of the Bank of the United States, name was Nicholas Biddle. He was a wealthy sort of aristocratic e e Easterner. And he was also a political financial supporter of some of Jackson's opponents. And so this made it both personal and also sort of uh, philosophical in his opposition. So th the problem, of course, is we've talked a lot about with money in American history, is that you kind of have two types of money. Uh, hard money, which is backed by gold, and silver, bullion, uh, and usually carries a lot of uh, respect, but at the same time is rarer, harder to come by. And then what you have soft money or paper money, fiat currency, where you as a bank would issue a note, which would serve as currency, uh, not backed necessarily by any valuable asset other than just the ability to use it itself. And so the state banks felt like the federal bank, the bus, was not giving them enough money, loaning them enough money to loan out to make more profit. 
And they wanted this. Meanwhile, the sort of hard currency advocates felt that that money backed by currency was the I mean, backed by gold specie was the only safe currency, particularly for foreign exchange. But also, you know, in times of crisis, you, you could trust that gold value would, would exist. Uh, couldn't trust paper notes, especially bank notes that were being issued by what would later become known as wildcat banks. Uh, and these wildcat banks certainly fuel speculation rather than cautious growth, rapid expansion. So try to think of this as the sort of more liberal economic policies, not liberal political philosophy, but the idea of just pouring money into the economy uh, uh, to, to fuel the economy, its growth. While this is much more conservative and say, let's do this at a measured rate. And you can see today that, uh, you know, the federal government has had to adopt more or less a total fiat currency when it comes to the pandemic, they printed, in essence, trillions of dollars to try to keep the American economy afloat. Uh, and and the, the great concern by sort of wealthy people is that this will devalue the money. It'll make the money go down. But we, that remains to be seen. And that's a future discussion, too, on Keynesian policies. Nonetheless, uh, Jackson vetoes the recharter. He, he says, I'm not going to sign this bill. He vetoes it. Uh, and then he, but he, he can't just kill the bank because the bank itself is going to exist for, you know, another four years, uh, even without it being rechartered. It already had been chartered that far. So what he done, then does is take all the federal government's money out of the Bank of the United States and deposits it in state and regional banks, which become known as pet banks by his critics. Uh, so he vetoes it rather than signs it. Um, and, and when it does expire four years later, you know, all the money is gone. <laughs> He'd already taken all the money out. And so the bank, this policy would continue under Mark Van Buren. Of course, we know today that the big result of all of this is a, is a terrible economic crisis called the Panic of 1837. But Jackson was willing to, to, to make that risk to, to prove a point. And here you see him destroying the bus in the background. The bank is collapsing. Um, I mean, look at how he, how he describes the veto. I really think this is fascinating. It is to be regretted the rich and powerful bend the act of government to selfish purposes. You know, folks today cry class warfare whenever you question federal bank policies or wealthy policies, but he says it would be regrettable if the rich and powerful did things selfishly. Distinctions in society will always exist, even under just government, all right? In the full enjoyment of the gifts of heaven, uh, our industry, economy, and virtue, every man should be equally protected. That's an interesting language, protection. When laws are going to add to this artificial distinction, in other words, uh, when obviously if you're naturally just, some people are, are wealthy and others aren't, well, that, that happens, he says. But if you make laws to benefit the poor, I mean, the rich over the poor, to make the rich richer, uh, then people have the right to complain. There are no necessary evils, he says. Um, equal protection, rich and poor. So his, his, his point for vetoing this bill is that the, the bus serves to benefit rich at the, at, the, you know, at the loss of the poor or the working class or the, or the frontier. And, and you know, later on in history, when we were we, William McKinley, uh, he, he would make a very similar uh, opposite, I mean, similar distinction, but on the opposite side. You know, he would say, oh, no, there's no such good thing as cheap money. So, you know, very different opinions here in Andrew Jackson and William McKinley. Um, so King Andrew the First, this of course would have been a cartoon from the Whigs. Uh, you can see here he's depicted in sort of all the regalia of a monarch. Uh, destroyed at his feet is the Constitution in shreds. Uh, he wields the veto like a monarch. And so this is where the Whigs kind of are born, because the Whigs really aren't those guys. Um, you know, they're the critics of, of Jackson. But if you'll notice here in 1832, there is no Whig party. Uh, it doesn't exist yet. Um, you have Henry Clay, who will be the last of the national Republican candidates. Uh, and Clay wins his home state and a couple other eastern states, and that's it. The, the, the tariff, excuse me, the bus and the tariff issue, actually, people around the country see as, as Jackson being the winner of those two things and not, and not uh, his rivals. So with that, you, you see the, the, you know, the, the statement of here comes money to these pet banks, which then many of them are becoming you know, terribly speculative. Here, just have a whole bunch of money and, and make sure you pay us back. Uh, and what that meant was people got a lot of money that was paper money, and then were trying to pay their debt to the federal government. Keep that in mind. They're buying the land from the federal government under something called the Land Act, which we'll, we'll go back and talk about that, the Land Act uh, that happened under Monroe. But, you know, Jackson says you can't buy it with paper money. You can only buy it with gold or silver. Well, that means all that 
all that speculative bubble that was created by his his separating the you know the, the money from the bank then comes crashing to a huge stop. Uh, now, of course, he does this to secure the credit of the United States, make sure our money's not utterly worthless. Uh, unfortunately, this this kind of crude, rudimentary economic knowledge, and it fails dramatically. Uh, and here you can see just it, it really is a, a terrible blunder on the part of the president. I think just the overall policy. But you can see here, money loses its value. Nobody's buying land anymore. You can't borrow any money. Businesses go under. And so this is why it's, you know, when you have political management of the nation's monetary policy, and that's what we call money, monetary policy, then you're, you're putting it at risk. And today, the, the, you know, the principal, you may think about Woodrow Wilson of the Federal Reserve Act, is to try to completely remove monetary policy, uh, central banking, from the political aspect of the United States society. So that basically, should we have money determined by elected officials or by sort of experts, uh, and that's kind of the debate that you know that will lead into the 20th century. I chose this to say, you know, I, and again, I, I don't particularly care one way or the other who's president as long as the country's succeeding. But you know, when you see people comparing data frequently, if you look at the, you know, the change over time, uh, you know, you're going to be like, oh, this president was successful, you know. Uh, and then you pick other stats, you know, like, oh, this president was successful. So it's often not a, an analysis of change over time. It's just, let me take a snapshot of this moment and compare it to a snapshot of this moment. Uh, and that's that's tricky. You know, most people know that statistics can be played with on, on both sides. Uh, but partisans, people who pick party sides, like to argue, look, my guy did it great and your guy did it terrible, rather than, you know, what's the evidence throughout the entire period. We don't like to look at stuff through the big picture. That's, that's too hard. It requires a little history background. All right. So Jackson uh, retires triumphantly, even in, in spite of all the sort of what I consider uh, today as a historical analysis, not particularly useful policies, either the Indian removal, uh, perhaps his handling in South Carolina was, was useful, certainly to send a message. But uh, in the bank policy, these weren't particularly great policies, but Jackson was seen to be at the time very successful. Like, in other words, his supporters were very, very happy with him, uh, even to his last year in office. Uh, he had become somewhat sickly by this period. So he picked his successor to be Martin Van Buren, who was a member of the cabinet uh, and vice president. And, uh, you know, that that means Van Buren is going to get all the problems of, uh, of of what Jackson kind of leaves for him. So uh, in, in 1836, you have another election, obviously every four years is determined by the Constitution. Uh, and in this election, the, this brand new party called the Whigs decide to run a strategy called the favorite son strategy. Let's let's run a guy from each region of the country uh, who are these Whigs. And then that will mean no one will win a majority. And that fails. You know, the Dems are still very popular both on the frontier and in the East. Uh, and so that, that didn't work. Uh, William Henry Harrison does very well in his sort of home region and a couple other places. Uh, Daniel Webster up here in Massachusetts, but it's not enough to win the majority. And, and they probably should be grateful that that was the case because Van Buren is going to have a very ineffective presidency. Uh, just a little bit of trivia. You may recall that Van Buren was from Kinderhook uh, up here in New York and it is possible that the phrase OK passed into the American lexicon because that's who he was nicknamed, Old Kinderhook. And really, in many ways, this election was a just a, a, you know, an election based on like who could come up with the cool slogans. And, and it would continue that way in 1840 as well. But uh, here you see that the, the, the really, the, I think, the political economic philosophy of the Democratic Party at this time is summed up in Van Buren's quote. He says, the less government interferes with private pursuits, the better. So that's very, very laissez-faire. So when you think about the, the irony of the American political party system is that when we started, uh, the Democrats were very, very laissez-faire, very much hands-off by the government. Uh, and, you know, the Republicans that would emerge from the Whigs were much more hands-on. Today, those two parties are seen as having kind of flipped. Uh, today, the Republicans are, are seen as the party of laissez-faire more. And the Dems are seen as sort of the, you know, Keynesian involvement in the economy more and often get accused of being socialist. Um, and so here you see, again, a democratic value. Look, in the, in the 
you know, the difficulties of our time are not felt by the agricultural interest. Uh, and that is because this is better. You know, we're better because farming, uh, even though Van Buren wasn't a farmer, but the proceeds of our food will furnish much of a way of taking care of our debt. So he, like Jackson, like Jefferson, like Monroe, put the, the kind of value of the United States in farms and not in factories. And that and that's an interesting argument. Um, but here you can see what part of the country most adversely affect by this. Well, wherever there was a city, uh, you can pretty much follow the cities here. So the argument goes is that the, the economy suffered most in the urban environments. Uh, and that's probably true because you we know, actually had an a, a interdependent economy more. Um, so I'm going to stop with this today, and we're going to take up the topic of Western expansion and Texas statehood uh, at a later date. But uh, with this, I'm going to conclude my presentation and uh, take any questions you might have.